I thank God for this opportunity to come to you again in this media with the Word of God. The title of my discussion this evening is Too Late. Too Late. Is it possible that there's going to be a time that it will be too late for you to make a decision about Jesus and the Kingdom of God? You have been hearing the message over and over, and perhaps you've continued to postpone and to postpone to repent and believe exclusively in Jesus for your salvation and for entrance into the kingdom of God. What I want you to understand is that there is an eternity future for both those who believe and for those who do not believe. Why it is still called today, it's time for you to make your decision for Jesus Christ. Whether or not you will spend eternity with Him or you will spend eternity in eternal destruction in hell. God is so loving and He says that He doesn't wish anyone to perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is offering it to you now. But the mercy of God is going to end at some point. And if you continue to reject Him at that point, it will be too late for you. My purpose is to make you aware of your eternal destiny. And if you have not made that choice yet about your eternal destiny by believing in Jesus, my appeal to you is believe in Him right now. Is your eternity at stake? Your future at stake? I know where I'm going because I've trusted fully in the message of the gospel that Jesus died for me and that He was raised again so that I can have eternal life, eternal existence with Him. If you want to know how, Romans chapter 10, beginning from verse 9, says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. You will enjoy an eternity with Jesus. And with God. If you don't make that decision now, a time is coming when it will be too late. When the door of mercy will be shut, it will be too late. When the trumpet of God will sound, it will be too late for you. There is a familiar hymn that we sing in church. The first line goes, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. When the roll is called up yonder, will you be there? So in this presentation, I just want to show you what the scripture says about the world and about the condition of people nearing the time that the Son of Man will come back, or Jesus Christ will be revealed to the world. I want to read you these verses so that you can be prepared. I want you to be prepared. To be prepared for your future, for your eternity. I am prepared for my eternity because I've trusted fully in Jesus. And Jesus says that the time He is going to come back, He was going to come like a thief. Which means that you are not going to know the exact day or hour in which he's going to come. But he will come. And in view of the time of his second coming, Jesus is saying this to you. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. 
it will be good for that servant for or for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes will jesus find you watching when he comes are you watching for him are you waiting for him truly i tell you he will dress himself to serve and will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them it will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak but understand this if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have not let his house be broken into. So, you also must be ready. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So the key point is here, watch and be ready. For that coming. The first step in being ready for the second coming of the Son of Man is to repent from your sins and to believe that He is your Savior, that He is the one that God sent through whom the world is to be redeemed. Are you ready? If not, a time is going to reach that it will be too late. For you to be ready. Jesus also explains that at the time when he's going to be coming back, people are going to be preoccupied with the things of this world. They will be trapped with the things of this world. And he explains that it will be the same as it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. God has destroyed this world at some point in the past before. In the days of Noah. In Genesis 6, we read that the earth had become so wicked. So wicked that the thoughts and the inclinations of the heart of man was evil all the time. Sounds more like our day today. And it also says that he distressed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone from heaven because they had given themselves over to wickedness and sexual perversion. Sounds more like our day. So that is why Jesus says that it's going to be the same as it was in those days. How is it like? Matthew, uh, Luke chapter 17 verse 26 to 30. It says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day that Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Here's the point line. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Exactly how our days are. We're eating, we're drinking, planting, buying, selling, building. And the thoughts of me, the heart of man, are increasingly wicked all the time. I don't have to tell you that. Look at our society. Look at the world in general. See the multiplicity of wickedness and oppression and suffering created by man on other human beings. He says, that's how I was in those days. And the key point to note here is that 
These things listed here are normal things for any thriving society. But the point made is that when eating and drinking, buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage becomes the preoccupation of our minds, becomes our priorities rather than the pursuit of God, then we are not spiritually alert. We are not spiritually ready. We are not spiritually watchful. And then destruction and judgment will come upon us unexpectedly. And when that time comes, it will be too late for you. It will be too late for you. Jesus also gave an illustration of how it's going to look like in the days that is coming. And he gave an illustration about ten virgins. This is in Matthew chapter 25, beginning from verse 1 up to 10 and following. He says, the kingdom of God at that time, and the kingdom of heaven at that time will be like 10 virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Some of you are married. Some of you may be looking forward to getting married sometime soon. Wonderful. You know the anticipation as a lady. You're waiting for the bridegroom. You're waiting for that day. That unique day. You are ready. There's probably no bride that you have to come and wake them up and say, Hey, 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 your husband is coming. Why? Because you want the marriage. You're ready. You're watching for cars driving by or like, Is he coming? Is he coming? Is he, is he coming? This is an illustration from natural, from nature, things that happen. So you say there will be ten virgins. And let's continue in verse 2. He said, Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. Five foolish, five wise. The foolish ones took their lambs, but did not take any oil with them. In those days, they burned lambs and they used oil to burn the lambs uh, they had to wait for a long time the foolish ones did not take extra oil but the wise ones took oil so the wise ones however took oil in jars along with their lambs the bridegroom was lo a long time in coming it's been two thousand years and jesus has not come back it's not revealed yet. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Then something happened. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up. All of them. Both the wise and the foolish. All the virgins woke up and trimmed their lambs to burn. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some oil, some of your oil. Our lambs are going out. Our lambs are going out. Give us some of your oil. No, they replied. The five wise ones, no, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, Go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready, watch the key word there, the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the banquet hall. And the doors were shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he replied, 
Truly I tell you, I do not know you. It's too late. It's too late at that moment. When the trumpet will sound that Jesus is here, it will be too late for you to make up your mind. Is your future, is your eternity. My appeal is, would you make up your mind now and be ready before it gets too late? And so it concludes by saying, verse 13, therefore keep watch, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So be always on the alert. So I say here, therefore keep your lamp burning. How can you watch? How can you keep your lamp burning? Repent from sins. Believe in Jesus. Obey his word. And flee from all sin and worldliness. I'll say that again. Keep your lamps burning and be watchful. How can you do this? Repent from sins and believe in Jesus. Obey his word. Live according to his word and flee, run, fly away from sin and worldly cares, the worries of life, the worries of what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? Where am I going to stay? Important things they are, but when they become the preoccupation of your mind, then they keep you from watching. They keep you from being ready for the bridegroom, for the revelation of the Son of God. In Luke 21, verse 32 to 36, the Lord Jesus says this, Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Luke 21 tells us about a list of things that are going to be happening before the coming of the Son of Man. Wars and rumors of wars, increased pestilences, distress all over the world, people being apprehensive, worried about what will happen. Sounds pretty much like our world today. Unless you're sleeping, if you watch the news or listen to anything or watch what has happened to the world in the past one year, you better be tell me that you are awake and watching and looking up to the skies for the second coming. Of Jesus Christ. And he says that the people who are going to start experiencing these things, that this generation, they it will not pass until all of these are fulfilled. And then he continues and says in verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful. Be careful careful or your heart will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the anxieties of life, the anxieties of life and that day will close up on you suddenly like a trap. Anxieties of life, the worriness. Today People are flogging to counseling, to psychologists, to psychiatrists. Why? Because the anxieties of life, the pursuit of happiness has held them down. More, more, more. Bigger and bigger and bigger. More money, bigger houses, more clothes, eating, eating, drinking, we are experiencing the worst form of epidemic in terms of overeating, especially in the United States today. Obesity is a disease, an epidemic that has been described as such. Billions of money 
spent on that. Why? Because people are caught up with the anxieties of life. People are caught up in debt because they want more and bigger and better. He says, be careful. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with these anxieties of life. I want you to stop and ponder. What preoccupies my mind? What is in my mind when I wake up in the morning? What is in my mind as I go throughout the day? As I come home? Before I go to bed? Why am I spending sleepless hours in bed thinking about my job, my house, money, or more of the things of this world that I can have? If this is where you are, you are not ready for the second coming of Christ. You are not watchful for the second coming of Christ. And if you don't make that decision now to put Christ first, live for Him, and be ready to die for Him, when the trumpet shall sound, it will be too late for you. It will be too late for you. God is giving you now a window of mercy. Sort of like the last opportunity. Look at this message. Though it were the last opportunity for you to have an appeal to repent from your sins and to believe in Jesus. Because if the thief comes tonight, if the trumpet sounds tonight, it will be too late for you. And one thing you know for certain, you don't control the next minute. You don't control the next hour. You don't control the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year. You don't control that. Tonight could be your final night. Oh, don't tell me I'm not sick. People die without having been sick. Or if that were not the case, should the trumpet sound tonight, that will be the end of you. So consider this as a window of mercy that God is granting you. A window of mercy before judgment, before fire and brimstone come upon the earth. Are you inside or outside the kingdom of God? We're going to read in Revelation chapter 3, beginning from verse 17. And this message is actually coming to people in the church. Let alone those that are outside. There's people in the church who are not ready, who are not watching, whose hearts are weighed down by the anxieties of life. Pleasure. The pursuit of materialism. The pursuit of money. More. Bigger better. And he says to them, you say I am rich. Yes, America, we are rich. I have acquired world and do not need a thing. You don't need nobody in this world. You have enough. Well, let's suppose. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. No matter how wealthy you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter how much possessions you have and have accumulated, if you do not have God in your life, you are poor, you are desperate, you are naked. And Jesus is saying to you, to church, so to individuals, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Let me just spend a little bit of time and examine those three statements. Buy from me gold refined in the fire. 
1 Peter 1 talks about our faith being refined as gold. Suffering, persecution because of the word of God refines you to be ready. Feels like we should all become Chinese Christians so that we can know what it means to be refined through persecution. The Western person who claims to be Christian does not see persecution. That's why we are proud in our world, in our deceptive freedom. He said, buy from me white clothes to wear so that you can cover your nakedness. White clothes in the book of Revelation refers to the righteousness of the saved. And the righteousness of the saved people do not come from them. It comes from Jesus Christ. When you surrender to Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, the righteous one, he exchanges his righteousness for your sinfulness. So that God looks at you who believe in him and say, you are justified, you are righteous, you are free to enter my kingdom. And that only comes by believing in Jesus. No one of us have their own righteousness to go before God. Most people today will tell you, oh, I don't need Jesus. I'm not a bad person. Oh, yes, you are. There is not a single person who is righteous. You have lied. You have deceived. You are jealous. You are envious. You have coveted. You have lost it. And that's still doing that. He said, come to Jesus, the righteous one. He will forgive you and give you his righteousness. He says, buy from me. It comes from God. And then, and salve to put on your eyes so that you may see. In Ephesians 1, beginning from verse 15, Paul says, I'm praying for you that God will open the eyes of your understanding. Only God can give you righteousness. Only God can open your eyes of understanding. He said, don't depend on your world. Come to me and I will refine you in the furnace of affliction, in the furnace of suffering, so that you will be glittering like real gold. Come to me and buy white clothes so you can wear. Come in repentance, and I will give you my righteousness. Come to me, I will open your eyes that you may see. He continues in verse 19 and say, Those whom I love, I rebuke and listen. That is my heart. That's why I'm bringing this message to you. To show you that God still loves you. And he's rebuking you to turn away from your sin. He's disciplining you to turn away from your sin so that he can give you an eternal life, an eternal existence. Life forevermore. No more death. Most of us have never experienced that. So it sounds like fairy tales to us. You don't know what happens after life. Life continues forever. And you are going to continue in this life, either in the presence of God or away from his presence in the in pit of hell and suffering. So that's why he's saying, I love you. That's why I'm saying, come to me. Eternity and the kingdom of God is so beautiful and so endless that he can push you in there. No, 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 no. You have to voluntarily Surrender your life to God. So it says, so be earnest and repent. Be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is knocking on the door of the church and the door of this world. The door of your heart. Will you open for him to come in forever? If anyone, it's always conditional. God is not going to force you. God is not going to force you. 
if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, and at this moment, I'm speaking the voice of God to you from the Word of God. If you hear this voice now and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they will eat with me. It says to those who, to those, to the one who is victorious, who overcomes his sinfulness, who overcomes the deceitfulness of wealth and the cares of life, to you who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has an has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hebrews 3 and 4 tells us, Today, now, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. Did you catch the promise here? He says to you who is victorious, I will give the right to sit on my throne. The throne of Jesus is the throne of God, and He is offering that to you. What an exaltation! Would you forego the throne of the Heavenly Father and of the Savior in all, because of the things of this world and end up in suffering in hell? How much more can God be loving? How much more can He give you? Jesus is going to rule the world. He says, you're going to sit on his throne and roll with him. He says that everything that is the Father's, the world and its resources and everything belongs to him. And he's saying, come to me, overcome this life and you will sit on my throne with me and roll. What else do you want to be offered to you? Are you going to give this up? Because of some fleshly pleasure, some more money you want to have, some sexual desires you want to fulfill, some more uh, 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 things, houses that you want to have. How much can God offer? He's offering his throne. Imagine. Let's say Jesus was the president of the United States. He's giving you the same power that he has to rule with him. Are you going to decline? There's so many people that if the president of the United States were to invite them to come to dinner with them, they will be exuberant. They will be excited. But listen carefully, people. It is the king of the world, the God of the world, inviting you to come and dine with him and roll with him and sit on the table and chat with him. What is holding you back? If you don't do that now, this is that window of mercy. When the trumpet will sound, it will be too late. It will be too late for you. Too late. Are you going to regret and say, had I known? There is a song that my friend gave to me a long time when I was back in Cameroon. He says it goes like this. When the saints shall march to heaven with Jesus as their leader, marching onward like soldiers, yes, able soldiers, singing and rejoicing, oh, hear the sinners shouting, oh, no, had I known, oh, no, the sinner's voice I hear saying, they have gone, they have gone marching to join the glory above oh no had i known are you going to be the one who is going to be crying that oh had i known had i responded to that message i heard that day because when the trumpet shall sound and the saints the believers will be marching into heaven you are going to regret it will be too late for you you will be crying, had I known, had I known, had I known. And now as you listen to this message, 
You now know what that future is going to be. Don't hold yourself back. Believe in Jesus. Trust in Him exclusively. Whether it's a matter of you dying for Him, dying in Christ means you live forever. You're going to die anyway, so why not die for a greater promise of an eternal life? And so that window will be closed. That window will be closed. So if you don't turn to Him now, it will be too late for you. How does it look like for those people when it will be too late for them? In that day, that day when the trumpet shall sound and time shall be no more, when it will be too late for you, you will regret. Because you have rejected knowledge now, because you have rejected this word of God now, that day it will be too late for you. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning from verse 20. It says, Wisdom calls aloud in the street. We're preaching this gospel everywhere, calling on you to come. She raises her voice in the public place, in the public squares, at the head of the noisy streets. She cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. Wisdom. This word's coming to you. It's crying to you now before the trumpet sounds. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. When you don't fear God and turn to Him in repentance, you are rejecting knowledge. If you have responded to my rebuke, if you have listened to the word of God now, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. That's what wisdom is saying. That's what God is saying. That's what I'm saying to you. That if you listen to this rebuke now and turn away from your sins, God will pour out his heart to you. He will make his thoughts known to you. Actually, the word, it's already right here. His thoughts are already right here with us. Do you know the thoughts of God? Do you know the Bible? You can't understand the Bible if you have not come to God in repentance. If you only love your wicked and sinful ways, you can't have knowledge, knowledge of God. The day that it's going to be too late, listen carefully. But since you rejected me when I called, and no one gave heed when I stretched out my hand, since you ignored all my advice and would not accept my rebuke, I, in turn, will laugh at your disaster. Yes, you're going to tumble into hell and God will laugh at your disaster because now he's extending his invitation to you and you are rejecting him and the knowledge and the wisdom he wants to give you. He will laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, are you overwhelmed with distress now? Are you overwhelmed with trouble now? Do you find solace in God? Do you find comfort in God? Or you are psychologically breaking down? Then they will call to me, but I will not answer. There's going to be a day that people will cry out to God and there will be no answer because the trumpet has sound and it is too late. Too late. They will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me. There's going to be a day you will look for God and you will not find him. You will call on God and you will not find him. But as long as it is called today, 
Romans 10 is saying that for whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's going to be a day you cannot call on him. Or even if you call on him, he will not respond. Because once the door of mercy is shut, once the bridegroom has come in, once it will be too late. It will be too late. So call on him now while it is still called today. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. Whatsoever a man sows, that he will reap. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety, will live forever, and be at ease without fear of harm. You know, people say, but why would a loving God send people to hell? Well, why would you allow a rapist in your house with your little girls? Why would you allow them there? Why would you take your money and give to a thief to protect? You steal the money. Why would you go and stand in the street in front of a murderer? If God does not have hell, then he has to accept murderers and wicked rapists in heaven. Would you want to live next to a rapist in heaven? A murderer in heaven? You don't want to. If God is just, then hell is real. Because wickedness is real. You, you have to recognize that. You have to recognize that. So what we're saying here is, listen now, repent, fear God, and have knowledge. So you can live at ease, both now and eternity. But if you don't listen now, if you don't repent now, there's a time that it will be too late. You will call God and say, uh-uh, I don't know you. You pray, you say, uh-uh, I don't know you. It will be too late. Because right now, you are rejecting knowledge, rejecting God, because of the pleasures of your flesh. Because of the pleasures of your flesh. It will be too late. Next, we're going to look at Amos chapter 5, verse 18 to 20. At that time too, what we're going to read, it will be too late. I already gave you the opportunities how you can watch, how you can be ready. If you don't want to be ready, if you don't want to watch, a time is coming when it's going to be too late for you. Amos 5 verse 8 to 20, 18 to 20 is talking about religious people. Yes, people in church. Yes, who are saying, we're waiting for the rapture, we're waiting for the rapture, we're waiting for Christ to come back, while their lives, they live like wicked people, like pagans, in hypocrisy. And the Bible is saying to you, even you who is waiting for the rapture, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled a lion from a lion only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a, a ray of brightness? Why will it be like this for religious people? Because you live in hypocrisy. You live in hypocrisy. You know your heart. You know your heart. You know what the Bible says you should repent from. You keep doing that. The day of the Lord will be what? Darkness, not brightness. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, Jesus is warning you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Not everybody who goes to church is going to go to heaven. 
only the people who have truly repented from their sins, truly believed in Jesus, are truly born again, and they truly obey the word of God and follow Jesus wherever he goes, even to the point of death. Those are the only people who will enter the kingdom of God. You may be in church, just doing your own thing. You may be in church, not even caring what the Bible says, not even caring to read the Bible, not even caring to obey the Bible. Uh-uh, heaven is not for you. It says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Listen carefully. They spoke in tongues. They cast out demons. They were prophets. They prophesied. They sang in the choir. They went to church every day. They were baptized. They were confirmed. They went to church Sundays, Wednesdays, Saturdays. But if you do all these things, and Jesus is not in your heart. And you know it. If Jesus is not in your heart, you know it. If you don't live according to the Bible, you know it. Because you don't read it in the first place. So you don't live according to it. Don't expect to enter the kingdom of God. See, many will cry to me that day, Lord, 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 Lord. We perform miracles in your name. We preach on your name. We prophesied in your name. We drove out demons in your name. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. Hmm. Will that be you? On that day, when it's going to be too late, you will drink from the cup of God's anger. Many, many will be slain by the Lord, herded out, gathered away into the fires of hell because you have rejected the Lord now. You have rejected knowledge. And even to you who goes to church but are hypocritical, you have rejected the true faith. In Revelation 14 verse 19 to 20, the angel of death is going to harvest this earth and gather up those who have rejected the word of God. Since so then the angel swung his sickle on the earth and gathered its grapes and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. God is loving, but he is just. He gets angry also. Wrath. Wrath against those who have rejected him and continued in sin. He said they were trampled in the wine press outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of about 300 kilometers or 180 miles. That is how much blood is going to be spilled of those who have rejected the word of God. In Isaiah, Chapter 30, verse 27 to 30, it says that in that day, when it's too late, men will hear the voice of God and they will see the wrath, the anger coming from the word of God. And why is God angry? Because we remain in wickedness. If you want to know why God is angry, there's so many passages. Go and read Romans chapter 1, beginning from verse 18 to 32. There it says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the ungodliness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For what may be known about God is made plain by what has been created. You suppress this truth that I'm declaring to you by your wickedness. You say, yes, I know the Bible says, don't live that way, don't do that. I am going to do it anyway. The wrath, the anger of God is on you 
who act like that. Absolutely. Because God is just and sin must be punished. He decided and punished his son in your place. And all God is asking you is to repent and believe. It cost you nothing. It cost you nothing. But you say, God says, as you live this way, I'm going to do my thing anyway. Do your thing. Hell waits for you. Period. Turn to God. Heaven waits for you. Period. Just that simple. Isaiah 30, beginning from verse 27, says, See, the name of the Lord comes from afar with burning anger and dense clouds of smoke. His lips are full of wrath and his tongue is a consuming fire. Did you hear that? The name of the Lord comes from afar. His lips are full of wrath and his tongue is a consuming fire. His breath, like a rushing torrent, rising up to the neck. He shakes the nations in the sea of destruction. He places in the jaws of the, in the jaws of the peoples a bit that leads them astray. That is what is going to happen to the wicked. God is angry at you because you have rejected His love in Jesus. But to you. Who fear God. And you will sing as on the night you celebrate a holy festival. Your heart will rejoice as when people play pipes, as people playing pipes go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. The Lord will cause people to hear his majestic voice. I hope you are hearing that voice now. And will make them see his arm coming down with raging anger and consuming fire with cloud burst, thunderstorm, and hell. It will be well with those who believe and rest in Jesus. But all these characteristics of the consuming anger of the Lord will consume those who reject knowledge. Who reject the word. Don't tell me you're a Christian if you don't read this book and obey it. Jesus said, if you continue in my teaching, then you are my disciples. You cannot say that you are Jesus' disciple and you do not follow his word. Millions who claim to be Christians do not even know how many books are in the Bible. They don't even know where to open to find things in the Bible. Is that you? And you say you're following Jesus? Zephaniah 1 verse 14 to 18. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. The day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and blackness. A day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner, the corner towers. Put this into context. As though this mighty hand of God was at, approaching New York, was approaching San Francisco, was approaching Minneapolis, was approaching London. It was approaching Shanghai, China, or some city in China. F try to imagine this. Because what is the, what are the cities doing? They have rejected God and they plant iniquity upon iniquity upon iniquity. Sin upon sin and they heap sin upon sin. So that day will be a day of distress and a day of anger, a day of trouble and a day of ruin, a day of darkness, a day of gloom, a day of clouds and a day of blackness, a day of trumpet and a day of battle cry. And that day, it will be too late for you to turn to the Lord. It will be too late. I will bring such distress on all people that they will group about like those who are blind. Because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like a dust 
and the entrails like dung. Oh yeah, that's going to happen. You better believe it. You cannot reject God and sin against God and taunt God and go free. Try that to American government. Try that to any government. You will not go free. God is stronger than the American government, than any other government. And you will pay for your sins if you don't allow Jesus to pay for your sins so you can go free. Come on, people. Why is this so hard for you to believe? Why is this so hard for you to accept? Because of something in this life that you want? How old are you going to be? And at 70, you are already bent over. At 80, you die off. Even if you get to 90, you have no strength to do anything. But God is promising you eternal life, eternal youth, eternal existence. You think he's going to come and beg you to give you eternity? You're going to do your own thing and bid your chest at God and go free? You're badly mistaken. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart because that day, when the battle cry sounds, when the trumpet sounds, and the battle is raging, and God is raging at the world, it will be too late for you to call on him. Call on him now. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of God's wrath. You are a billionaire, it will not save you. You are a millionaire, it will not save you. You live in $20 mansions, it will not save you. It will not. You have billions in the stock market, it will not save you. You have 100 cars, 10 cars, 5 cars, private jets, it will not save you. It will not. You literally will be just you. And you will leave everything behind and burn in the fire of hell. It's coming. You better believe it. It's coming. You can ignore it. Your choice, your destiny. Your choice, your destiny. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole earth is consumed. The whole earth. For he will make a sudden end. Of all who live on the earth. Honestly, he will make a sudden end. E-N-D. You will end suddenly. And afterwards, the fires of hell. If you don't believe in Jesus now, today. While it is still called today. Because at that time, it will be too late. I say, your world. As we see here, you know, neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on that day of the Lord's wrath. It will not save you. Your mansions of glory will not save you. Your fancy cars will not save you. Your designer clothes will not save you. Nothing. Nothing. Proverbs 11 verse 4 says that wealt, wealt, is worthless in the day of wrath. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath. But righteousness delivers from death. Come on, people. Hear the contrast. You're going to hate me. But I am bringing you love. I'm showing you light and darkness. God says, come to me and it will be well with you. If you turn away from me because of the cares of this world, because you are running after world and material things and everything, it's going to end abruptly. World is worthless in the day of wrath. You may be the richest country in the world. You will end abruptly in the day of wrath. You may be the richest person in the world, in your country, in your town. Your world will not save you. We know so many billionaires, so many millionaires, their wealth will not save them. Accept the light. It says the contrary. But righteousness delivers from death. Wealth, wealth, money, possessions are worthless 
in this day of wrath. But righteousness delivers from death. What did I say about righteousness? Believe in Jesus, he exchanges your sinfulness with his righteousness, and you are acquitted. You walk into the kingdom of God. Just like that. Righteousness delivers from death. Your idols will not save you. Whatever you trust in, whether it's charms, amulets, whatever you your hope is on, it will not save you. Your idols will not save you. And the Bible says that even though God is shaking the world as he is shaking now, everybody is waiting for life is going to go back to normal. Let's do everything. Let's do everything. Let's do anything so that life will go back to normal. It will not go back to normal. Satan is planning horrible things for this earth. And they're happening. The horrible things. You're not going to go back to normal. See, so even though these things will be happening, you, you, you still don't want to repent. You only want the economy to get better so you can earn more money, so you can have something to eat, so you can have a place to rest your head. Things of the world. We read it already. As it was in the days of Noah, people were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage, they were buying, they were selling, they were building, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and took them all. There will be an abrupt end to this world. Sudden. Abrupt. And if you are not hidden in Jesus, you are going to be swept to the fires of hell. Shut out from the presence of the Most High. Revelation chapter 9 verse 20 to 21. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues Plagues, pestilence, viruses. The rest of mankind who are not killed by these viruses still did not repent of the, of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshipping demons. You worship demons called celebrities. You want to be like them. You want to live for them. They're demons in human form. They're idols of gold. Silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic acts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. You're not repenting. You're not turning to God. That's what he's saying. That even though people are dying like flies here and there in the plague, in the virus, you still don't want to repent. Well, Jonah chapter 2 verse 8 says that those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's law for them. Yes, you're clinging to worthless idols. You don't want to repent. So you forfeit the love that God is showing you, the love that I'm declaring from this book. Psalms 31 verse 6 says, I hate, I hate those who cling to worthless idols. As for me, I trust in the Lord. I hate those who cling to worthless idols. They cling to their designer clothes or their wealth, their money, their car, their house. And it's all that defines them. Their beauty, even. All that defines them. I, was, I hate those who cling to wordless idols. And these idols, your world, will not save you in that day when the trumpet sounds and it will be too late. Too late. You are not going to hide when the Son of Man appears. In fact, the Bible says, okay, yeah, we'll, 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 I'll just read what I have here. And I'm, I'm running it down here. Too late. I don't know how often I've said those words. If I say it a million times, there's a time coming that it will be too late for you to call on God. Because right now, as these words are coming to you, you still continue to reject God in your heart because you are running after the things of this world. You may be going to church every Sunday, every time, and going and going, but still your heart is not with God. You know that your heart is with God when you 
listen to, study, obey, and live according to the Bible. If you don't, then you don't belong to the kingdom of God. Matthew 24 verse 24 says, Then, 24 to 30, you say, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. The sign of the Son of Man in heaven will appear. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn. They will cry. They will weep. When they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Why are they going to mourn? Because they have rejected him now. Revelation 1 verse 7 says, Look, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. You're going to see him. You either accept him now and see him rejoicing. Or you're going to see him and be kicked out of the way and swept into the fire of hell. There's going to be no neutral ground. You cannot avoid him. At that time, you cannot even commit suicide. Because you have the body with which you will suffer in hell or enjoy heaven forever. You're going to want to die, but you will not die. So you make the choice now. Revelation 6 verse 15 to 16 says this. Then the kings of the earth and the princes, yes, the kings and the princes, the generals, these are the strongest powerful people. Think about the generals in Pentagon. Think about the king of England or the queen of England, the king of Saudi Arabia or the president of the United States. All these people who reject him now, the mighty, and everyone else, including you, both slave and free, hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They call out to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They're going to run everywhere, but there will be no place to hide you. You're going to face the Son of Man. You're going to face the God of Heaven. You're going to face the wrath of God if you reject to turn to him now. You're going to face it. You're going to want to commit suicide. You will not die. You will walk into hell with that body and suffer with that body. And this generation will not pass. It'll be too late. If you went that far, it will be too late because you will be ready to face God's judgment. To be ready to face what? God's wrath. Revelation 20, 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence. <laughs> Ooh. And there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. History books. Another book was open, which is the book of life. It's your name in the book of life. There's a song we sing that you're going to run to the mountains. The mountains will be melting. You'll run to the sea. The sea will be dry. Where are you going to spend eternity? Where are you going to spend eternity? See, the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Your tape will be played. Are you living for you or for God? The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up death, the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. How do you write the name in the book of life? Believe in the Lord Jesus.
Turn away from your wickedness. Trust in Him. Obey His word and commit your life to Him whether you live or you die. Then your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know, we're written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But if you don't do that now, at that time, it will be too late. It will be too late. When God will make everything new for us to enjoy heaven on earth, you will languish in hell. Revelation 21 verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, you don't believe what I'm saying. The vile, the murderous, the sexually immoral, all kinds of sexual perversion, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, and all that nonsense. All of them, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And I want to leave this with you. I don't want it to be too late for you. I want you to be watchful and I want you to be ready. I said all of this with love. In fact, Jesus says in Revelation 3, as we read that, those I love, I discipline, I rebuke. See this as love. And this is love. If you are driving down on a road and the road is cut into two, and somebody is telling you that, turn around, because if you keep going, you're going to sink. Does that person hate you or love you? In terms of the gospel, you think, I don't love you. But there's a cliff ahead. If you keep driving at that speed without Jesus in your life, you're going to sink into that cliff, and beneath it is called hell. You burn there. Revelation 22, verse 10 to 15. Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let him who is who does wrong continue to do wrong. If you want to continue to do wrong, God doesn't stop you. Go ahead. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. But let him who does right continue to do right. If you are doing right, please continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. There's always a division there. You want to be wrong? You want to be vile? Fine. Keep on. But if you are righteous, and you are holy, excellent. Keep on. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may go in through the gates into the city, outside at the docks. Those who will practice Magic arts, the sexually immoral, we've already listed those, and the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Will you make your choice now for heaven, or it will be too late when the trumpet sounds? Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, everyone is invited. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take of the free gift of the water of life. Your choice, your destiny. You choose death and hell, that we will give to you. You choose life and eternal life, that we will give to you as well.